Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Diafano. Howdy, howdy. I feel the need to say howdy because Daisy's got her cow boots on, um, cowgirl boots on. But yes, we're here with the local painter, the legend, Miami legend, Daisy Fitzgerald. Woo! Who also happens to be my best friend and former roommate. I'm Yanni. I'm Betty. And here we are at Diafano. Um, so I want to start us off with a little bit of background on Daisy's work, some overarching themes, and what basically led her here to the present. So Daisy, could you tell us a little bit about um, you know, your upbringing in Miami and what sort of culminated in your current artistic practice? Give us a little summary, a little timeline. Um, I started in, I was living in a house on 8th Street and I got an easel and some paints when I was in, I was like 14 or something and I started, started working from there um, and I used the colors from Kayocho for a lot of the paintings and collages I was making and then I went to, to art school in Kansas City for university and now I'm here. And now you're here. Yeah. Wonderful, beautiful. Take us through um, the sort of concept of this show. First of all, start us off with the title and what sort of overall themes are uniting these five works. I wanted to make paintings that led um, the viewer into some kind of like odyssey or adventure. Um, so each one is a different scene uh, from a kind of like Odyssey that someone is taking. And is this someone you, is it based on your personal experiences more or less, or is it more meant to be a universalized sort of Rorschach test for other people? Yeah, it can, I mean, I, t I took from my experience and then everyone around me as well and transformed it into a painting. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. So we have five pieces here, uh, some off camera. We have three pieces behind us. Uh, a portrait over here and a larger piece of a house over here. Uh, so we'll be getting into it shortly, but uh, I just wanna ask, how is it that you get into the flow state? Because I remember living with you for as long as I did, one of the main things I loved about having you as a roommate was you were always so steeped into your artistic practice. You made it uh, a sort of mission of yours to make sure that you got in your creative time and that was one of the main things I would see you do. I would walk out into the living room and you were just painting all the time. And I just want to know, like, how do you get into that flow state? Because I'm sure as an artist myself and other artists listening, maybe we uh, struggle with that sometimes, with getting into that flow state that we feel like we can really focus and shut out otherworldly distractions. So how do you arrive at that point? I try not to flow. Flowing doesn't... Um, I. I tend to overdo things or mess things up with the flow. The flow is, is hard for me. Um, I try to stay as aware as possible when I'm working. And so I try not to get into like some kind of like um, altered state when I'm painting. But when I am pro like generating works or making the drawings for the paintings, I, tr I do get into more of a flow state where I'm getting into whatever instincts I'm having at the moment. Um, but when I'm painting, I, I'm very methodical and I, I try to um, pay attention and not like muddle up the colors or something like that, so. Um, speaking of methodical, so I saw you mention earlier that one of these paintings, you only did horizontal brush strokes. So I, one, I wanna ask more about that and where else that is in the other works, but also I guess you sort of talk about how there's like a flow state in your preparation and then it's almost like a rehearsal and then you come to perform and execute something very diligently. So are you sort of planning, yeah, how, what method of brushstroke you're even gonna be applying before you start painting or do you, do you have some room for altering which way you're gonna go about something? 
Yeah, I, I start off very free with the drawings, um, but then when I'm working, I try to, like when I was making these paintings, I had a series of watercolors for them. And I stayed as close to the drawing as possible. So um, whatever marks were being made were planned ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever colors I was putting down was also, like there wasn't any like leeway. It was like the drawing is the end. It's the, blue, it's the blueprint. Yeah. So again, though, just the horizontal strokes, it makes me so curious. Like, what, why did you want to do that? That's this one, by the way. Uh, it's the three houses yeah. painting. They're all going towards the right. And it was, I was trying to depict um, kind of the way things are, were leading um, and how nature divides and separates people just organically. And the, the marks were this kind of um, way of showing the, the entropy of things or like the way that they were heading. Mm -hmm. um, so having them all go to the right was a choice. Um, I made this, this drawing when I, I first moved to a new place and I could see the future of it, um, but we were st still in like the current state. But the marks are um, depicting the way that people separate or come together over time and through just like natural processes of life. Yeah. I, like that. I, I like that form of mark making that sort of like, uniformity applied to an entire image because it kind of implies that everything is everything and there is like a sort of subconscious like um, more than meets the eye kind of structure working behind everything that ties everything together um, which I think is uh, tapped into like a sort of like universal consciousness in a way which I think is like prescient in all of your work because it can apply to both the personal and the universal, as you said. So yeah. that's cool. What, like, what led to these color choices then? If color choice is a very important thing for you, and I know you were tapped into this organic state when you were sketching this out at first and choosing the colors, but what do you think subconsciously led to the color choice? Uh, I was really inspired by stained glass um, buildings and architecture and, um, for this three house painting, I wanted to capture the feeling of like just arriving somewhere new and the colors are so bright immediately when like when you walk through the door or when you arrive to a new place and everything's like very stimulating. I was trying to capture that feeling. And like a contrasting piece to this, in my opinion, is the blue house that we have behind the turntable. Uh, it's pretty much monochromatic, you have a lot of cool tones, there's no real contrast there, mm -hmm. but there's still that element of like a house in nature and there's even some figurative um, elements there. So could you walk us through uh, what that, me that painting means to you and how it might contrast or even relate to this other one we were talking about? Like what the painting's about? Yeah. Um, uh, in Key Biscayne, you can see the stilt houses. Uh, Betty and I were talking about this earlier from the view of Bill Bragg's that's right next to the lighthouse. And uh, stilt houses have always been kind of this strange uh, outs like structure looming outside of Miami that they're kind of like watching from afar. And they're very... Um, precarious, like we have so much flooding and hurricanes. Um, and I wanted to make a, a house that was built off of this kind of weak foundation, like you're not completely safe there, but it is still home, so you're comfortable. And uh, the painting's about deciding whether to stay somewhere where you're comfortable, and, but you're still going to be, you're not going to be completely safe. Um, and deciding whether or not to leave. And the, the guy in the back is um, rowing away in his canoe. Um, and so the painting captures a moment of 
a decision. Um, and the figure's going like this, going like this. <laughs> and it, it's showing like an ambivalence, um, literally in the form of the figure. Uh, so I wanted to show that moment of having to make decision whether to stay in some place where you know uh, very well, but it's still not completely, you're not guaranteed any kind of like safety or comfort or leaving for something new on an adventure, um, which then um, embarks like the next um, paintings. Would you say like if this sh series of works was uh, to depict a sort of chronological timeline, maybe that would be the first one? Not necessarily, I think they can all uh, change. I, I wouldn't say it's chronological um, at all, yeah. It's funny because I've read that painting before hearing you talk about how it's somebody deciding to leave. To me, it immediately, in my mind, I thought homecoming. You know, the windows look so inviting against this cold light. It looks like you just want to come inside. And I guess that does actually, though, speak to the idea of comfort, but instability, the comfort and the, the instability you know, I guess. But it, it made me think of this James Taylor song Terra Nova, which is like all about sailing and how he misses his family and friends. And the last line in the song is, I've come home to stop yearning, which I just immediately like sort of like whispered in my mind when I looked at this painting, because I think it's just very interesting that you could read it in either way. Like I imagined this being someone waiting for the person to finally return, because for me, when I think of an odyssey, I guess the odyssey ends when somebody returns transformed. So I guess that could segue into my question of, yeah, where does this odyssey leave us off? And is it inspired by the literal odyssey? Because I see this image of what I think is a sailboat through binoculars and that, you know, strikes an image of the story of the odyssey. Yeah, it actually was um, completely inspired by that. Um, if the hero has to leave home or they're trying to get to that and like that's the ending. Um, Odysseus ends up at home um, and there's a lot of sailing and having to confront sea wenches and <laughs> ogres and um, cyclopses and things like that. Um, and James Joyce then took the Odyssey and then made it into Ulysses, which mm -hmm. is more about this guy just trying to like get home to his girlfriend. <laughs> he like goes to the pharmacy and that's like a whole huge deal and like he's confronted with like this sexy cat at home or something like that. <laughs> um, so I was I was going off of um, I was trying to create like um, images or paintings based on everyday experience, but like transfiguring them into like a higher, um, vo like a magical like voyage, basically, yeah. Definitely, it's interesting because even though this image has a lot of figures in it, I think it's because we don't see like features, everyone appears silhouetted, it still feels very alone. Um, could you tell us more about this like choice of silhouetting and this sort of, I guess, unknowable the grouping of people. Yeah, I wanted to leave the figures anonymous for the most part, um, besides the painting in the front, um, which is a portrait of uh, James Deering loosely. Um, I left them anonymous so they could stay in this space of um, basically taking everyday experience and transfiguring it into um, like something more abstract or universal, yeah. So in a way, it's like we can, without a, a face to recognize, we can project our own ideas or characters, characters into those like faceless things. Like in that way, do you mean universal? Like for the viewer or? Yeah, maybe. I'm st I, I'm not exactly sure. I th maybe there is an element that the, the viewer can project onto it. Tell us more about why you chose, you just randomly said James Deering. Why, why James Deering in that one portrait? Because I look at that portrait and it's almost like Christ-like, but I've also seen that face before in other works of yours. 
And it also kind of could be like a male version of you, but maybe I'm just obsessed with you and I see you and everything, I don't know. But tell us more about that portraiture because that's a very, that's very much a schism from the anonymity that prevails in your other work. Yeah, I don't always paint anonymous um, figures. It's just for, for this one, I wanted to, um, for the, the family portrait, I wanted it to be um, kind of a stand-in for families that's and a family portrait, the orange one? Yeah, in the like desert. The desert yeah. that's very bleak? Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's about how families end up, like they start uh, as this one unit and then eventually um, life takes over and nature takes over and you become separated. So in the back there's all these figures and they're lit literally um, separated by the landscape. For, for this one, for the James Deering portrait, it's, I was painting, I was making in the, in the watercolor sketches I was talking about earlier, uh, I was making a portrait of just a man in front of Vizcaya, uh, which is a mansion off of um, Biscayne Bay in Coconut Grove. It was one of the first um, huge houses erected in Miami, actually. And it was when we were developing Miami and creating it um, to become this like tropical paradise for northerners to come during like winter time. Um, and he, he built Vizcaya in 1916. And it was like the first, James Deering did. Uh, it was the first kind of dream for Miami. Uh, this house was supposed to be set the precedent for everything else that was built later. And it was for artists to come down and party and have like a kind of like 1920s like speakeasy. Um, and there's this pool underneath um, the, the mansion built in Biscaya that is um, actually from like a freshwater spring and there's like marble. Um, carved into like goat's heads and it's just it's this insane place and he created this um, and I learned later that he died in a um, ship he died on a ship on his way back from France to Miami and I, I made the painting after I mean before I knew this but I, I kind of felt like maybe it was like his ghost or something in in the work yeah it started through. off as sort of like an anonymous portrait. You were just drawing a face. Yes. And then you realized afterwards, like, wait, this kind of looks like James Deering, and I just got back from Biscaya and learned that he died on a boat, which is very interesting because the sailboat behind us and the whole odyssey, it's almost like an odyssey unfulfilled. Yeah, he's, um, he's like, he was an aesthete, and he was maybe, like, homosexual or something, and... He would invite um, John Singer Sargent down, and John Singer Sargent made these beautiful alligator watercolors that I've always looked at, and I didn't know they were from Vizcaya, and I finally like looped wow. it around. Full circle um, moment. But it, that's the thing, when I was making it, I wasn't specifically thinking about him, but learning about it later, maybe something like got into um, me when I was working, but it also is just like, um, a man in front of the landscape of Vizcaya, basically. What would you say was the most challenging aspect of creating these works? Challenging? Um, the world's pretty indifferent to whether or not you make paintings or make any art in general. And I was faced with a lot of um, obstacles in the way that seemed more pressing or it would take a lot of my energy and I had to and it, it, they, it seemed like they were constantly testing my commitment to painting and whether or not I wanted to keep doing it and so I had to like constantly push through all of these things in the way um, of making something that's seemingly superfluous or something so that was that was challenging for sure I'm sure a lot of artists can relate to that and I like that you own the fact that these are based off of those personal experiences because you know, you're not seeing those experiences as a distraction. You're letting them inform your work and it, it comes across as very authentic. 
even though it's not self-obsessed either. It's, it's still very much grounds for someone to relate to it, and it's not, it's not too specific. Thank you, that's very nice. Yeah, you're all right, you know. <laughs> yeah, there are some, I'm really interested in the composition of the one all the way to my right, I guess our left, the binoculars look, well, I guess we're flipped around. Sailor. The yeah, the sailor yeah. painting, yeah. Tell us more about the composition you chose for that, that sort of like framing element just really focuses in on the painting and completely changes it. Yeah. Um, my partner and I were living apart for a while and they were in Chicago. We were sending drawings back and forth and they sent me this drawing of a sailboat with this figure on it and I painted, um, a, a, I made a painting of it initially and then I added to it again um, and made a second painting and that's the sailor painting. Um, the Initial drawing didn't have the binoculars in it at all, and I added that later because I was um, thinking about someone on an island, like looking and um, seeing this like red sail from afar and it coming closer, and like the anticipation of something new coming in and like mixing everything up. Um, and I, I sent my partner also some drawings and they did paintings of them. So we've been having this kind of back and forth um, thing with each other. I love that process, especially because it's so, it's extra poignant considering that Chicago is kind of like a bay. I mean, it's on a river, but like it's lake. This, this lake, right. Lake, lake Michigan. Is, right. It's crazy. Um, it's crazy because it's like, it feels like an ocean out there. But it looks like an ocean. It looks like an ocean. But it, you have this relationship with water in both of your lives because we're on the bay too. So I think that's really cute. <laughs> There's that relationship there. Yeah. And you're almost like peering out at him through the binoculars trying to yeah. connect. Um. For you, what does the red sail mean, right? Because when Odysseus comes home, the, the sail that he flies is supposed to say whether or not he's, you know, alive or not. So what does the, what is the message the red sail tells? It's my partner's favorite color, so I didn't, I'd choose it because of that. But you're right, there is, um, I don't know exactly the color, but it's like if it's white, then it means survive, yeah. survival. And I think they don't switch the sails and his dad throws himself off the cliff because he thinks he's dead. Yes. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the binoculars are cool too because it like puts us in the shoes of the person waiting, which is, is cool again to think about. I think an odyssey can be a very like main character driven sort of thing, but this sort of gives you a pause for a moment of who are we coming to home to or who did we leave behind, you know? We're not on a journey alone. There are people waiting for us or missing us, which I think is like a very, I think a really sweet and sentimental note. Something I noticed living with you was you would have these random sort of sweeps with your paintings where you just would decide like, I'm not gonna hold on to this one anymore. Granted, we were in a small 3-1 apartment, so space was definitely a, a concern. It was a big concern. But you would just give these paintings away or, or toss them out, and I always remember questioning like, what was your sort of like rationale what is your standard for how does how does a painting make the cut so to speak and how do you decide if it's getting thrown away or not uh time de uh, decides that i think uh, whether or not uh, it stands if it i let it sit around for a while the paintings and then if they're still if i'm still dissatisfied with them i'll i'll get rid of them and how do you know when you're done with a painting with with this with these with the series of works, I had the watercolor drawings, and so there wasn't any question. It was, does this look exactly like the drawing or not? And if it did, then it was done. And what about in general, though? Because you don't always have that process, do you? Or uh, no, I don't. 
So when you don't necessarily have a sketch, first of all, do you ever paint that way? Like, do you ever just start with a blank canvas and no other precursor, no other references, and just go ham, and then you arrive at a point where it's just done? Have you ever done that? No, I always have a, a drawing or a sketch. So probably when it looks like the drawing. Um, before the series, I was um, getting into a flow state and just kind of like going nuts and letting out all of the, these instincts um, that I had um, or impulses. And with these paintings, it was more about um, not giving into every single impulse you have, but waiting and being patient and deciding when and what was the right thing to do in the moment. And no matter like if I wanted to like work really like in that moment, I knew it wasn't the right time. I would mess something up or something. So it was about a lot of restraint. I like that word restraint. Yeah. It's like it's a very intuitive process. Um, I'm wondering what kind of influences I guess we could start off specifically with like artists and art movements and then we can expand to what in life influences you, but are there any artists and art movements that you are inspired by that show up the most maybe in your work or the way you think about your work? Um, I really like stained glass and the way that the light um, is like pushing through the color and like illuminating it. So I was looking at, at that, and I was looking at illuminated manuscripts, Persian miniatures, things that were telling stories, because stained glass was also uh, a didactic tool for the church, and it was um, trying to like educate people or show them um, scenes from the Bible. And I really like some German expressionists, like Emil Nold and Max Beckman. Um, as well. They're telling stories, but not a, in, as a direct way. It's more about like the atmosphere at the time and the certain people. Um, and um, I like more modern influence would be Adam Green. He does, he makes music and films and paintings based off of video games. Um, but I like how he makes his personal experience into a kind of caricature separate from himself that can be related to by other people. It makes sense that you, have, you gravitate so much towards the act of storytelling because you, you do be reading books. That's another thing that Daisy does a lot. If she's not painting, she's always reading a goddamn book and I admire that about her. <laughs> uh, what, so what other influences in life, uh, what, what, what do you, what do, yeah, what, what are you influenced by that isn't necessarily an art movement, uh, what things sort of like call out to you? Maybe like on a recurring basis, let's say, is there, are there things in your life that you kind of find yourself like returning to in your work thematically? Yeah, I mean, uh, reading is a huge influence, um, novels, um, and the people that I'm surrounded by as well. Um, Often I'll draw, I'll make drawings based on scenes in, in books and things like that. Um, there's this one scene that, well, it's not, it's not here, so maybe I shouldn't talk about it. So talk about now, it. <laughs> talk about but it. yeah, I was influenced by um, Homer and the Odyssey and Ulysses um, for, for, this, for this group of paintings. Yeah. So what about like your daily creative practice because I talked about, we talked about how you get into this flow, which you hate the flow, but how is it that you keep your creative muscles limber? What, are there any, is there any sort of um, regimen? Is there anything that you build into your daily life that keeps you uh, creating, that keeps the creative juices there? Uh, not having a, a set schedule, like not doing anything the same way every day, um, as well as being around people that challenge me a lot. Yeah. In what ways do they challenge you? Asking you hard questions in an interview, like me? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just keeping me on my toes and um, forcing me out of like my preconceived notions of things or what I, like my idea of what a day looks like, things like that. Um, that's basically it. Yeah. 
Um, so I know you studied art history at uh, Kansas School of Art, Kansas City. Kansas City Art Institute. Kansas City Art Institute, right, the famous one. Um, you studied art history there. You worked in art restoration afterwards when you first came to Miami. Could you speak a little bit more on those experiences and also how they might have fed into your work? Um, art restoration was good for me because it taught me not to be so precious about art. Um, we were working in some guy's garage restoring um, ceramic horses from the Tang Dynasty with Elmer's glue and then tossing it into the back of his like pickup truck and then driving it over to South Beach for the client. So it taught me that art isn't as precious as I initially thought it needed to be. We were handling these objects that were like thousands of years old and just throwing them around. <laughs> and they were fine, because they've, they've lasted that long, so they, they're always gonna be fine. And even if they break, we can glue them back together, so. So how many times did something break and what happened after that? What kind of like, I'm just curious, I always wonder about this. People who work in art restoration, like, what's the like protocol when something does break and you're trying to fix it? And like, even if it ends up like worse than the original condition, like what do we do from there? Well, what, where I was working was really off of the norm because they were, we were a small business, but you, typically museums, when they're restoring art, they have like a whole bureaucracy and you have to kind of outline what you're going to do first and then it has to get approved. And with us, we just kind of really assessed what was going on and then just did it. Um, so it was, I mean, we had clients whose kids were like heroin addicts and they would knock over all of these pieces and oh. that were like thousands of dollars and we had to like restore them really quickly so there wasn't any protocol we just just did what we needed to do in the moment yeah. keep doing it over and over yeah. yeah wow what's the craziest piece and like or like maybe like your favorite piece that you've restored the tank dynasty horse with the glue yeah nice are there any other like past experiences, like maybe in like your employment? You used to work at like a rug place, right? Yeah, I was repairing rugs as well. What, how, do you think that's fed into your work at all? Because there's like a lot of patterns and textures maybe in your work. I noticed yeah. there's a lot of texture in it. I like how an ornate the, um, the rugs are. And then also the weaving uh, process is similar to painting. You can think about it like with your brush strokes like that as well. Yeah. So Daisy, what is next for you? What other plans now that you've committed yourself to this art show and it's pretty much over in some time? What, what's next on your horizons? What, what are you planning on doing? I want to start making books, homemade, um, and other than that, nothing, nothing really planned. Yeah. One day at a time. Um, all right, well, I think one of our like, favorite like, last questions to ask is, what advice you would give to aspiring artists? I think it's always, everyone has a different answer, so. And also maybe it doesn't have to be other artists or something maybe you'd wish you'd known before and know now that is valuable about art. Uh, I don't really like giving advice, but... Um, That's true. <laughs> you can say, but I don't know, and then it doesn't matter if it was bad advice. Yeah, I guess don't, don't be a busybody. I've seen a lot of that going on lately. And What do you mean by busybody? Just constantly making work all of the time to feed some kind of um, mm. like content need mm -hmm. or something. Um, yeah, you don't need to make content. You don't need to constantly keep up with um, the endless loop because it'll just get lost anyways. So, yeah. Very true. Very true. It's Daisy Fitzgerald, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I know you kind of hate social media, but where can we find you on social media? Um, 
Daisy Fitzgerald. There's some underscores in there. Um, probably. Right. I think yeah. it's like Daisy underscore Fitzgerald. Yeah. Daisy Fitzgerald underscore. You got a website, right? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, she's working on that, everyone. Yeah. But yes. All right. Thank you guys for coming. First solo show of many. We'll see. Keep your eyes on Daisy Fitzgerald. Thank you. Good night. Oh, and also just a final shout out to the space. Shout out to Shotgun for letting us use their office. Shout out to Diafano, obviously. Uh, shout out to Stephanie, Philip, Mauricio, Charlie, everyone involved, the DJs, Optical Records for DJing for us last minute. Thank you guys so much and have a great night. Thanks.